with another kind of a revelation within the field of osteopathy where this guy, William Sutherland, was kind of looking at a, a skull that was disarticulated. So like all the, you know, like the wiggly joints, the sutures that are there, and the, they were kind of like this in the skull and then just connected with pegs into the center. So it was kind of an exploded, you might say, version of the skull. And he was looking at like, with the, with the sagittal suture, this one here, that's just wiggly like a piano hinge. And you know, there's no mistakes in nature. You know, if there's something there, there's a reason for it. Form and function, it seems, are interrelated in nature. That's and so he was looking at like, for, the, for instance, the temporal bone. And he found that on one side, it's, the bone is beveled inwardly, I guess you can call it. And on the other side, the bone is beveled outwardly. So the way it fits on the bone in front of it and the bone behind it is such that if it were moving, if they weren't fused as they thought they were at the time, it would move kind of like the gills of a fish. They would kind of like open and widen and rotate. And, and all the structure accommodated that. At the time, of course, anatomists were thinking that the bone of the skull fused into one and there is no movement. Since then, they found that it's really clear there are vessels that move in between the scalp and the intracranial space. And there are stretch receptors even, it seems, that when the bones do open a certain amount, they tell the inner workings of the brain to you know, release pressure of the cerebral spinal fluid. So it kind of uh, comes back. So there's a lot going on that's basically been proven. We don't quite understand exactly the whole mechanism, but we understand that there's a respiration that's now called the primary respiration. And the primary respiration is primary because it, it doesn't change so much, unless we have a fever or if there's a major trauma or something. Throughout our lives, it's pretty much a steady, like six cycles per minute. There's a respiration. There's an in and an out. And the uh, primary because, again, it, it's the last one to leave after death, and it's the first one when we come, when we, when we start are born. And then our breath respiration is secondary, and that changes all the time, and that's you know, flexible, and we can control that. And then our heart is, a, is another respiration. These four ventricles, by the way, are the, where the, the cerebral spinal fluid is being produced. And so it's flowing. It starts kind of in these lateral ventricles. There's an, a little specialized tissue called the choroid plexus that takes blood that comes up to the brain, and then the blood-brain barrier is right there where kind of like these little, they look like little grape um, bunches. So they, the blood moves through thinner and thinner capillaries and then somehow magically it's extracted the most pure aspects of the plasma and that becomes what's called CSF, cerebral spinal fluid. It's produced in the choroid plexus, which everyone agrees on. It fills the space, which everyone agrees on. It then expands the whole cranium, which is up for discussion, but that's pretty much makes enough sense. And as it expands all these, the intracranial space, there are those stretch receptors that I mentioned yesterday in the sutures in each of the cranial bones. And those stretch receptors, as it starts to expand, send signals back to the choroid plexus, stop producing, we have enough. And then slowly that fluid through the nerve roots and they think through the lymphatic system, and they're not really sure where, <laughs> but it kind of seeps out through the different like places where the nerves go out. And it kind of bathes, it seems, the rest of the body and just returns to the bloodstream. And then those stretch receptors stop signaling, the cranial sutures come together, and the choroid plexus produce more, which begins that cycle again. So in that process, these ventricles are kind of doing this you know, also expansive kind of a dance, and they're doing this rocking thing. And again, we don't necessarily want to go into this today, but as you put your hands there, you can tune into the fluid on many different levels. Let's say your hands are like this on the parietals. You're going to feel their hair, or first a little warmth maybe, or like a proprioceptive field, where they're like, all right, this is my space. And then you kind of can connect in, you feel their hair, you feel their scalp, you might feel a pulse, you'll feel their breath, you feel the sliding of the skin, etc., etc. You go layer by layer, you'll get to the bone, and right on that other side of the bone, and this is what I was saying they don't often teach for some reason, this CSF 
as it's released into the spinal cord, also is released into that arachnoid space on the outside of the brain. So we can get to this place where those bones are like these just gently floating little sheets on top of this, this you know, millimeter thick ocean. And that can be a really juicy place. And it could really help those tectonic plates, you know, of the, of the brain and the bones interact and free up. So as that CSF is being produced in those ventricles, it's, it spreads and, and fills that ba the whole brain and bathes it and, and holds it in this like water jacket, you might say, of um, bounce and vitality and energy.